Hello, I'm Jill Joplin, Executive Director of the DeKalb Library Foundation. The mission of the DeKalb Library Foundation is to provide support for DeKalb County Public Library beyond public funding and to enrich the lives of DeKalb County citizens through educational, cultural, and literary programs and services. So we are proud to be able to sponsor this session of the AJC Decatur Book Festival. The Decatur Book Festival supports local, independent booksellers who have been partnering with the festival since its inception. This evening's bookseller sponsor is Cheris Books and More. It is my pleasure to introduce the panelists for Crime Down South, Tom Mullen, Attica Locke, and S.A. Cosby. All three of these authors use a combination of research, imagination, and real life experiences to bring you stories such as history making cop beats, missing children, and career criminals. They are all award winners and their work garners descriptions such as pulse pounding, gripping, gritty, and twisty. This evening, the authors are here with Emory history professor Carl Sudler and his graduate student, Kareem Joseph, to discuss what they all love about crime fiction. And don't forget, use the donate button at the bottom of the screen to support the Decatur Book Festival so they can continue bringing literary programming to our community. Enjoy. I, again, I'm Carl Sudler. I'm a professor of history. Um, here at Emory University, and I say here because the Decatur Book Fest is here in Atlanta. Um, and I'm an African-American historian whose research interests really look at youth, race, and crime, and I study how Black youths navigate the legal system. And I use this kind of valuable time in the introduction to introduce myself in case anybody was wondering, why am I here? But I'm here to have a conversation with our illustrious guest. And I'm joined <coughs> by co-moderator Kareem Joseph, um, who is a doctoral student and centennial scholar from Emory University's Department of English. Kareem's research uh, seeks to unsettle notions of crime and Black criminality in African-American crime and detective fiction. Or put differently, he is here to ask the much better questions than I probably will. But, <laughs> but together, we are honored to be in conversation with our three panelists. We have S.A. Cosby, Right, uh, an Anthony Award winning author from Southeastern Virginia, whose recent Blacktop Wasteland has been generating a heck of a buzz. He even got a, a I, I saw the tweet from Stephen King. Uh, that was huge, right? Yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. Uh, we also have Attica Locke, the award winning author of five books and most recently have been my home, which will largely be the focus of our conversation today. And she's also the television writer and producer for, you know, shows like when they, docuseries like When They See Us, Little Fires Everywhere, you know, no big deal, all the big stuff. So we are delighted to have you with us today. And Tom Mullen, author of five novels, including the award-winning Dark Town and soon to be award-winning Lightning Men, which will largely be the focus of our conversation today. How is everyone doing? Good. Good. Yeah. Thank you for having me. So we're gonna, I wish we were all together and sitting together and then enjoying our conversation off, on the stage and then off the stage, but we're just gonna kind of jump right in in this virtual world, if that's all right. I was gonna give a quick brief overview of the books to our listeners um, so that we would all be on the same page, but then I was worried that I was gonna be giving away too much of the plot. So, and I'm terrible at giving away spoilers, and we want the people to go buy these books, read these books, and so I don't want to spoil them. So before we begin, begin, can I ask each of you to just give the 60-second elevator synopsis of the novels that we're talking about? Um, so I'll start with you, Attica. Okay, Heaven My Home takes place uh, in and around Caddo Lake in East Texas. Darren Matthews is a Black Texas Ranger he gets called in because this nine-year-old white kid is missing and he needs to find the kid. But while he's trying to find the kid, maybe get some info on the kid's family because the kid's dad is a captain in the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. So Darren is wrestling with what does it mean to save a kid that is connected to that kind of racial violence? Um, and can the kid be saved becomes a metaphor for is there a way to stop the perpetuation of racial thought, uh, racist thought and um, racial violence? 
Perfect. I like it. Tom, Lightning Man, talk to us. Lightning Man is set in 1950 in Atlanta, and it follows a number of characters. Lucius Boggs and Tommy Smith are police officers, and they were part two years earlier of the inaugural class of Atlanta's first eight African-American police officers. And so they are navigating you know, how to do their jobs, how to bring um, how to control crime and bring justice while at the same time having to work within the Jim Crow system. And they're really wrestling with whether they're even doing the right thing to be police officers. And it also follows a white cop named Dennis Rakestraw. Um, and he lives in a neighborhood that had been all white, but now um, some African-American families are moving into his neighborhood, including some relatives of one of the black officers and uh, tensions in the community are ratcheted up. Yeah. And then finally, Sean. Um, Black Tail Wasteland is the story of Beauregard Bug Montage, a former getaway driver, an auto mechanic who finds himself pressured by financial calamity. Um, and so he finds himself pushed back into the criminal underworld and behind the wheel for an ill fated jewelry heist. And it's also the story of a man trying to navigate his own toxic and tragic masculinity. Okay. Perfect. Yes. So you guys were much better at doing it than me because I promise I would have been like, and then on page 98, and then I, I would have spoiled it. I didn't want to do that. Um, but um, these books all, obviously all take place in the South, right? We're here to talk about crime fiction down South. And generally speaking, we have different parts of the South well represented here. We have Georgia, we have Texas, we have Virginia. Um, and we also have a balance between like urban and rural, right? Because when we're thinking about the South, we're also kind of navigating these types of spaces. Um, given this, right? So th there's that for the setting. Given this, historically speaking, when we have conversations about crime, especially crime in the South, there there's always tends to be these kind of lingering ties to race and slavery, right? Which I feel all three of these books capture beautifully in the text. So when writing these stories, how do you capture this, right? Or I guess perhaps put more directly, how do constructions of race and slavery influence the setting in your work? Whoever wants to jump at this one first, I'll take it. Well, I mean, um, in my, in my so book, it's kind of literal because there's, there's a, a freedman's community in in the book and it's based on um it, it there are a lot of these dying freedmen's communities in texas my family comes from one called nigton nigton uh, <laughs> so we get real clear on what the hell the white folks was calling it and so it's quite literal there that um that the the the, the, the tentacles of slavery are still so very much alive in the south uh, and I think one of the things that's interesting about when I write rural, rural Southern noir is that for me, the, it's the, the city seems safer to me than the, than the rural areas. Like for me, and it was like that when I was raised up, I grew up in Houston, but whenever we went into the country to visit relatives, that was, oh, that always felt more lawless, um, than, than, than the city. Like it felt like out there, you, they were just doing whatever they wanted to do out there. And you see that in the beginning of Sean's book, like they just be doing anything. There's no, there's no, the law doesn't really work out in the rural South. And that feels very connected to plantations being separated. There being a sense of um, just that people are making up their own rules out in the rural South. That That's my, that's my answer for it. Yeah, Sean? I think it's a, to echo what Attica said, I often say that the scariest place in the world isn't a dark alley in a city, it's some country road at night and you see headlights in the distance. Um, and the isolationism of a rural area in respect to the tentacles and the, and the shadow of slavery is that a lot of times we feel like, I'm, I'm from a small town and a uh, smallest town in Virginia. And a lot of times you don't feel that there's any justice. It's just us. And, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up learning to basically not depend on the police. The police weren't there to help me. I, I grew up learning how to avoid the police and not in a nefarious criminal sense, but just avoid them so that you don't get killed, that you don't get shot, that you don't get a, 
in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that, you know, you, there's a direct through line from that mentality to slavery, to slave patrols, to plantation life. And, and, and I love growing up in a small town. I love writing about it. And I love evoking that small town, town atmosphere. But at the same time, I realized that my parents, myself, even my niece, we exist in a dichotomous environment in small towns that there's still a black side of town and a white side of town. You know, um, there's still a black funeral home and a white funeral home in my small town. And so those uh, issues are subtextual in Blacktop Wasteland. Right. You know, I don't hit anybody over the head with it. It's not a 300 page sermon, but they are definitely subtextual, but also foundational to the story itself. Absolutely. And then Tom, you want to chime in as well? Yeah, I mean, in, in Darktown, it's set in the 40s, so it's only 80 years removed from slavery. And, you know, the main characters, Boggs and Smith, they're, they're trying, they, they hope that they're doing the right thing by becoming police officers, but they're wrestling with it. Because on the one hand, you know, it was a big deal when Atlanta hired its first eight Black cops, and it, it was an honor to get to wear that uniform and show that they could do this. And the community really rallied around them, at least at first. But at the same time, you know, they worry, like, are we just empowering the, the oppressors? Are we just becoming a part of a corrupt system? Like they, they wanna believe that they're doing the right thing, that they can help their community, partly by protecting their community from all the corrupt white cops. Um, but they're also afraid that, you know, just by being a part of the system, they too will be corrupted. Um, and so it's very much a, 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 an issue that they're wrestling with throughout the book, uh, throughout both books really. Um, and, you know, because it's Atlanta, just not that far from the Civil War. I mean, this is, this is still the Jim Crow South. They are still living and breathing this very, very toxic environment. And they're hoping that by becoming cops, that this is a sign that the city is evolving and that with World War II having just happened a few years ago and this, this idea that we were gonna defeat fascism over there and we're gonna defeat Jim Crow over here. There's, there's this hope that maybe we're gonna get past that, but there's also a fear that those hopes, like so many others are just gonna be dashed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And so, Kareem, you had a question that you wanted to... Yes, yes. This question um, st still still deals with um, setting. Um, but I'm thinking about setting in relation to local color and to give audience the, the context uh, for, you know, what local color is. It's a genre of fiction um, that focuses on the traditions, the customs, the principles of a particular region and in the context of Southern literature, um, I'm interested in um, juxtaposing Southern crime fiction with the regional genre of local colors preoccupation with perpetuating universalist notions of antebellum values, customs and experiences, particularly through setting, right? So um, what are the ways um, you all use setting to foreground um, subjugated or concealed histories and experiences as, you know, writing against local color, which portrays um, the South as idyllic and picturesque, so. Um, I'll say this. So I, part of the book takes place in and around Caddo Lake, which is so big, it, it crosses a state line, it goes into Louisiana. And then the rest of the book takes place in Jefferson, Texas. Jefferson basically has built a cottage indu industry of selling their version of the antebellum history. There's a Gone with the Wind Museum. They do reenactments. There's Confederate statues everywhere. And I definitely, through the course of the book, question um, what it means to sell history and to sell it wrong. And um, the main character, Darren, is, is wrestling with that. And um, there's actually a character in the book who tries to have an alternate read on that history. Um, and so I've done this several times with the books that seem most obviously about the, the legacy of slavery. Every, if somebody's black in my book, the legacy of slavery is in it, period. But when I wrote about a book called The Cutting Season, which took place on a historical tourism plantation, I'm really interested in how history gets sold, commodified, and whitewashed, and, and all this kind of stuff. And I definitely think that the prose in Heaven My Home challenged the idea that um, Jefferson was doing right by history. So I think, oh, go ahead, Tom. 
Oh, no, that wasn't. Go ahead. I, I was just going to echo what Attica said that, um, you know, like with Blacktop Wasteland, it's 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 a twofold uh, uh, issue. I, I wanted to write a, a really cool, interesting, fun heist novel. I wanted to set it in the rural South. I wanted to set it in the rural Black South because you don't see a lot of that. And so, you know, I wanted it to be exciting. I wanted to have, you know, the, the narrative beats, three act structure and so on and so forth. But I also wanted to tell the truth about the South. I love being from the South and I love being a Southern son. At the same time, I love the beauty and like you said, the idyllic nature of South, but there's also the grotesqueness. You know, there's, you know, there's there's magnolia trees and honeysuckles and, but then three steps from the courthouse in my hometown is a Confederate statue, you know? And there's no, that's not a mistake that they put it three steps from the courthouse. It's a reminder, it's a message to any person of color that if you go there looking for a redress of grievances, you are out of luck. And so that again is I think more subtextual in the book, um, but it's definitely a part of the Southern experience. You, you know, as Attica said and Tom said, you cannot talk about or write about the South without the history of not just slavery, but Jim Crow, of classism, of racism, you know, uh, you know, there's in, in, in Black Child Wasting, there are two uh, white characters, Ronnie and Reggie Session, the Session brothers. And they are struggling through their poverty, which is a lot of their own making, but they don't see how much they have in common with Beauregard because they still mm -hmm. a little bit better than him. You know, they, they still think that, you know, as, as, uh, as I think it was Lyndon Johnson said, you can always convince a white man that he's better than a black man. And then you, he'll let you pick his pocket for free. And I think Ronnie and Reggie have a little bit of that. And that's something I grew up with. I, could, I, could, I grew up in a town where I play football and wrestle and, and, and play sports with guys. And then we get off the field or leave the gymnasium. And they still thought they were a little bit better than me because of the history of white privilege and white patriarchal supremacy. And so, you know, there's a one of Bogues or Beauregard's problem in the book is that uh, – a, a couple of white guys have won the lottery, literally, and opened up a rival auto mechanic shop. And everybody's gone to that mechanic shop. Not because they're cheaper, not because Bug isn't an expert mechanic. It's because it's a predominantly white town and they feel more comfortable going there. And so those little things are just bits that I try to sprinkle into the story to give readers a sense of what it feels like to grow up south of the Mason-Dixon line. Yeah, and for me, I'm, I'm the only one of the three who's not a native Southerner. Uh, I was born in Rhode Island, in, up in New England, and I moved around a lot. And so when I wrote Darktown and Lightning Man, you know, I'd written three books before, but they'd all been set in different parts of the country. Um, and this one, I very deliberately wanted to write a book where I was living now. This, this is our home. This is where my wife and I have settled. This is where we're raising our kids. And I kind of wanted to you know, roll up my sleeves and, and grapple with Atlanta, partly just because I wanted to write about where I live, but also because it is a fascinating place historically and politically. And it's like that old Faulkner line, you know, the past is always with us. It's not even past. You know, just by setting a book in Atlanta, it's hard not to mention the Civil War. And if you write a contemporary book about Atlanta, it, you, you wouldn't be able to not mention the Civil Rights Movement. You know, my book is set sort of before the, the first key victories of the Civil Rights Movement, but there are references to the Civil War. I didn't want to overdo it, but you know, the, the white cop in July goes hiking on Kennesaw Mountain with his dad, a hike they do every year because they, they do it to commemorate the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, which of course was a Confederate defeat, but they still commemorate it because of the whole lost cause thing to kind of idolize their defeats. And they, they have this you know, sort of martyr complex about how they were taken advantage of by the North. Um, so I just, you know, I wanted this book to feel Southern. I wanted you to really believe you were in Atlanta, whether it's just describing uh, nature, but also just the way people talk and the way people interact. And I think that, you know, as a reader, you're sucked into the story more if you feel like you're in a particular place. And if a book doesn't feel like it could have been in any other city or any other town, I wanted to feel really of its time and place. And I think, you know, Sean's books and Attica's books do that so well. And my goal was to do the same. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Right. Like, I mean, there's no doubt, like, I'm like, you, Tom, I'm a northerner, right, who now lives in the South. And, you know, there, there, there is something to be said about, you know, when reading these books about, like, feeling that you're in the space, right, feeling like you're in the spaces that we're talking about. I mean, with, you know, Attica's book, like, you know, you can, can I say the tap, or the, you know, Hope Town, right? Like, so, like, you know, there are moments where I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm in Hope Town, right? Like, um, and I'm just like, 
Um, and so, so the setting is, is, is so important um, here, right? And the setting also informs uh, the character development, right? Um, and, you know, in particular angles, the plots of each of these texts. And so again, as somebody who studies crime, like, you know, as a piece of scholarship, I often tell people, and I kind of joke about it, it's what I would refer to as a semi-joke, uh, because it's partly true, and I say it so people, if they laugh, I don't get totally offended by it, but I want to write a biography, like a historical biography of Bigger Thomas, right? That's like one of my like dream projects somewhere down the line. Um, and for those listening who are like, who the heck is Bigger Thomas? Bigger Thomas, main character, and Richard Wright's native son. And the reason I say it's only a semi-joke is because Thomas is clearly a fictional character who was developed at a time uh, in large part around the contemporary conversations of crime during the period, right? That is conversations about crime in the 1930s and 40s informed Richard Wright's development of Bigger as a character, right? And so because I have you all with me and I was just like, this is also true for the, the main protagonist in all of these stories, right? Um, so just thinking about the contemporary conversations about crime, about criminality, how do they inform the character development in your work? I mean, like, you know, I'm thinking about bugs and, you know, but well, I'll just, I'll throw it out and I'll tell you <laughs> where I was going with that. But yeah, Attica. So we'll keep the same cycle going, this works. <laughs> um. I'll say this, I think, so it was a big deal for me to write a, a cop. I always mm, said I would mm. never write a cop. Like, and not, I just feel like I don't see the world through the eyes of the establishment. But once I kind of could realize that Darren could sit at this juncture of thinking, this, he could sit at the center of this polarity between believing that the law can help black folks if one of us is wearing a badge or nah, mm -mm, walk away quick. Like if he could sit there, then he could get, I could write him. And I think his understanding of what is and isn't a crime is what makes him fascinating. Uh, in Bluebird, Bluebird, and in Heaven in My Home, he, it's also what makes him, it's also what makes, how do I articulate this? The way that he bends the law and the fact that he can do that is also an indictment of police. Because, and I think he's kind of psychologically aware of like, I don't think I should have this kind of power, but at the <laughs> same time, maybe I can use it to break laws in order, he, like he's constantly living the question of what in front of him is actually a crime. And what is something that, if I understand it psychologically as a black man, meaning there's this character, Mac, who is believed to have killed, um, a white supremacist who came on his land. If I want to protect a 60 something year old black man from going to the death row, then am I, am I doing a crime if I help him cover it up? I, I don't know. And so I think that is the most fascinating part about that character. And also, you know, I got a ways to go in terms of where, how this book series wraps up, but I, I'm, I'm interested currently in the question of the, how much, it seems like it's too much power for a cop to be able to just be deciding, even if you are Robin Hood, even if you are doing what seem like morally correct things, it doesn't quite seem right that you could be making it up as you go along. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, John I or Tom? Yeah. I just, um, you know, I think a lot of books I think do a good job of kind of exploring those ethical dilemmas that you know the cops or the prosecutors face. Um, and, you know, okay. that my, um, like in in the second book in my series, Enlightening Man, you know, there is a scene late in the book when one of the black police officers does something unethical, and I wanted to kind of shock the reader. Um, I, I didn't go there with the first book in the series because I was already dealing with so much, and I didn't want a, a scene like that in the first book. But I thought it'd be interesting to see what happens when one of these men does abuse his power. You know, what's that going to do to him? What's that going to do to his partner? And, and you know, there are big ramifications of, of his act. But you know, I there's been a lot of um, you know soul searching this summer. There have been a lot of interesting essays written about you know, books about cops or TV shows about cops and you know, how they've been putting forth dangerous narratives about the police and like, have they not been questioning things? And I think definitely there's been plenty of shows 
in books that have done that. But the books that I tend to gravitate towards are the ones that are really grappling with these issues and asking difficult questions about, you know, are the cops, is being a police officer, is that power corrupting? And, you know, can you have a good cop? And what happens when someone, when they, when they have this opportunity to bend the will in a way that they think might help, but is still deeply unethical? Or what happens when they see someone else do that? Or what happens when they're a supposedly good guy, but they're surrounded by people who are not on the force? And I think those are really messy, complicated stories, but I think they're very interesting ones to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And both you and Attica, I mean, the, the black cop nar narrative, I mean, my goodness. Um, so on, but yeah, sorry. Oh, no. Uh, I was going to say my first published uh, detective uh, crime novel was a detective novel called My Darkest Prayer. And it's about a former sheriff's deputy named Nathan Waymaker. And I made him a former sheriff's deputy because I wasn't ready to tackle those questions. I wrote it a few years ago because I was wondering about the same thing. You know, what is the, you know, is, is the power that certain police officers or all police officers have to a certain extent? is it for the greater good? And in my mind, I, I didn't feel that the answer was yes. And so, uh, I, but in Blacktop Wasteland, Bug exists outside of the police force. He exists in a, in a, a sort of nebulous criminal underworld. Um, and he is fully aware of the challenges that present specifically because of his race. And he knows that, you know, if he gets caught, he's probably gonna do more time than say his white partners. And he's fully aware of that. And so, he has made a decision that this is the best way forward for him. He struggles with this decision. And it's not something that he takes lightly. And I think even as we get toward the conclusion of the book, he's still struggling with it. Um, but it's something that he has decided that his reasons for being a criminal outweigh any moral compunction they may have. You know, he's trying to take care of his children, all three of them. He has a daughter from a previous relationship. He has two sons with his wife. He's trying to take care of his mother. He's trying to keep his business afloat. He's trying to take care of his cousin who works for him. And so all these pressures, all these responsibilities outweigh whatever philosophical quandary he may have or find himself in about the nature of crime. And I think there's a part of him that is subconsciously pretty pissed off because he knows he's smart. He, he bugs his type of character when he walks on Rome, he knows he's the smartest character in the room. And he's pissed off because the world he was born into doesn't allow him to take full advantage of his, uh, his talents. He, there's a line in the book where he says, uh, a counselor, uh, like a, a juvenile counselor is trying to help him. And he's like, you know, for, him, for boys like Bug, options are, are luxuries and he doesn't have luxuries. And so he definitely, is aware of the nature of his own criminality, but he feels like it's a viable trade-off because the why should he play by the rules when the world doesn't play by the rules? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot, right, in terms of the moral dilemmas from all of them, right? From the, I mean, thinking of it from the police officer perspective, but also thinking of it from Bug's perspective, right? And really what kind of drives Bug in that, in that space is, you know, so much that what you capture is his living conditions, right? Like, I mean, when we think about people who turn to crime, right? So much of it is is not like you know they're bad for the sake of being bad, right? And you and you're able to capture that so well in uh in, in Blacktop, right? Like, you know, he's not doing this because he wants to, um, and 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 that's a pivotal part of the story. Uh, Pre, sorry, go ahead, throw up your next question yes, for yes. our panelists. I had a different question, but since you know we're talking about moral dilemma and um, split selves. Um, I'm interested in, because um, I seem like a recurring theme in each of your books is this um, wrestling and this reckoning with multiple aspects of oneself. So I'm, I'm just interested in um, the ethical arguments that, or ethical commentary that you all might be making. Um, in terms of the characters or in terms of taking up ethics and morality as a object of critique, if that makes sense. Hey, I mean, kind of what Sean just said really resonates where there's a sense of, in fact, I see it a lot in both Bluebird, Bluebird and Heaven My Home. Darren talks about the fact that maybe 
justice is there, there there is no literal justice it's 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 poetry like it doesn't have a fixed set meaning if this again this this older elderly black guy who wanted to shoot a white supremacist who threatened him maybe that shit is fine but then then if that's fine then how is it fine that the white supremacist was doing what he was doing. And I think he, Darren says a lot that maybe only poets and bluesmen know what is real justice. Um, I, I think that, uh, and all I can say is that is, is creating stories that ask the question and, and having created a character who lives the question. Because I feel like I don't have all the answers either and that I'm okay with certain things that people do that if the tables were turned, I wouldn't be okay with them. And so I don't know where the clean um, ethics or morality lie. Uh, I, I have a fun of, I mean, the only thing I would say is I think that Darren is a humanist. And I think that fundamentally he would never equally say that the actions of this white supremacist line are equal to the actions of what this elderly black man did. Um, but that's not what the law says. And so, and it gets messy and there's a twist in heaven my home that i won't bring up that i don't know maybe <laughs> he read that whole situation wrong and that <laughs> flips him out like all of a sudden he's like wait i thought i was protecting this old man and so mm -hmm. you, you know once you start breaking them rules where does it stop I, yeah. you almost tempted me you almost tempted me i almost came in with the, <laughs> oh yeah but, but i i fought it i fought it <laughs> I think the question is interesting because it is, you know, it's a philosophical, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's a Nietzschean question, you know, Be just because you can some do something doesn't mean you should do it, you know, and, and, and that's the philosophical question, I think, at the heart of crime, a lot of crime fiction is, you know, like when you know, talking about Black Child Wasteland with Bug, you know, there's a point in the book where Bug does something nice for someone. Uh, there's a there's a, a couple, their cars broke down, the young lady's pregnant, and Bug uses his driving skills to get them to the hospital um, before the baby is born. And he does this nice thing as he's casing the uh, jewelry store. And then something happens later in the book that makes him feel almost guilty. He regrets having done that nice thing because it made the criminality that he's compartmentalized, it made the criminality that he's justified human. It, it puts a face on the violence and the and his actions and, and his actions and the consequences of those actions. And so, you know, but I knew I, I knew growing up guys like Bug who were able to put that morality in a lockbox for a time being and do what they felt like they had to do. And it sometimes does take that crime or that those repercussions reaching out and touching them, you know? Um, and so the question of the flexible moral compass comes up more often than not in crime fiction and especially in Black Top Wasteland. And I, I, I don't, like Attica said, I don't have the answers. I think the best writing asks the really good questions and then we leave the answers to uh, the philosophers and, and the poets and the blues men. But I'm interested in asking the questions and I'm interested in what happens um, as a result of those questions and actions. Yeah, I think part of having those ethical dilemmas in the books is that, you know, as writers, we're trying to create interesting characters. Like we want them to be complicated. We want them to be intriguing. And it's funny, if you think back to like the classic Raymond Chandler books that kind of were credited with starting this whole genre of a hard boiled story, you know, the, 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 the main character, doesn't really have all that much going on. It's like, sometimes he might mention that he has money trouble, but doesn't really seem to bother him. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have a wife or girlfriend. He's kind of just this, this blank canvas, this white detective hero dropped into the middle. And like, not to knock the classics because they're awesome. And, and you know, we all love them obviously. And they did a lot to create this genre. But I think it's a lot more interesting with a lot of these more contemporary stories when your hero has a lot of problems. They, they've got family trouble, they've got financial trouble. And like, when you're dealing with those things, you, you've, you're distracted, you're not always your best self. You're not always making the best decision. And you know, how you decide to navigate a situation is going to be Compromise isn't exactly the right word, but they're going to be affected by the fact that you've got all this stuff going on in your life. So that's, I think, one of the reasons we try to make them go through these tough ethical gauntlets. But also, I think it just makes the story more interesting. You know, when the readers wonder, like, well, gosh, 
what would I do? Like, it's not as simple as like, oh, that's when I shoot the bad guy. Like we want there to be this complicated question that they're struggling with. And, and as both Attica and Sean both said, it's like, we don't always know what the right thing is. And, and the, the, the act of writing is our way of kind of exploring, well, gosh, well, what would happen if I did this? Or what would happen if I did that? Or like, ooh, that's bad, well, that's bad too. And you get to kind of play around with all the different possibilities and explore it and hopefully, you know, make it more complicated. But I think, I hope that those very complications make it more intriguing for the reader. Yeah, no, for sure. I think a lot about, um, whenever I teach classes, right, so history professor at Emory, right, I always teach classes on mass incarceration. I teach classes on, you know, civil rights movement. And, you know, I, and I always tell my students, right, crime is immeasurable, right? And they're like, what do you mean it's immeasurable? You can tell who gets shot or if we're, you know, who, you know, what stores are broken into. And so if we're talking about property crime or violent crime, like, we know when incidents happen. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, when I'm saying crime is immeasurable, I mean that, you know, how we quantify crime is based around like arrest or incarceration, and neither of which is actually a true indicator on if crime happened, right? Because we know that certain neighborhoods are policed in different ways than others, right? And we know that certain people are incarcerated at higher rates than others because of a flawed system, right? So we have incarceration rates, we have arrest rates, but none of those can actually quantify crime, right? And so I hate, 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 and I always combat it when the media is like crime is high and so and so and I'm just like how do you know right you just you, th there's no way of kind of knowing that um and, and so what you know when when I saw the panel was like crime fiction in the south I was excited and then I got even more excited when I realized that two of the three books were actually about black cops right because you can't have crime without the police right um like in a very weird way, right? Like they're part and parcel of each other, right? You need both to exist. And so thinking about the contemporary moment, thinking about conversations um, going around with the police right now, right? You know, we, we, we're having conversations in particular in black communities that the police have over-policed and under-protected these communities and, you know, brutalized with impunity um, for decades, right? For centuries even. Um, so when considering that in some ways, both, the well, not both, but the conversations in particular around say reform, abolition, defunding, all of these in some way, shape or form are imaginative projects, right? I was really excited to ask you all this question. Um, all of these things are imaginative projects. So is there an opportunity in crime fiction to push this conversation further? Right, especially as conversations, again, thinking about these conversations, whether we're talking about reforming the police, right? And, and you kind of speak to it in, in the different books, right? In different ways, or defunding the police or abolishing the police, like as these things become more mainstream, at least in terms of starting the conversation, is there space in crime fiction to really begin to imagine a world police free, or at least the, the way that the police exist today? And so, it's the abolitionist in me who really was like, oh, I wanna ask these phenomenal crime fiction writers, what role does the writer have here in really being able to push the imaginative boundaries of questions of police reform? Um, yeah. Well, well, I can say this because I think it's part and parcel of what I've already said, that if you not just see a cop bending and breaking the rules with impunity, and not being caught, how easy it is to do. But I have a character who admits it's too easy to do, <laughs> who, who basically was, he's contemplating uh, how to uh, fabricate evidence. Like, and, and because he's conscious of, mm, I don't think this should be like this, but I'm doing it for a good reason. I think, see, for me, that is the closest I can get to the idea that police have too much power is that their ability to manipulate truth and to be listened to and be believed as being the arbiters of the actual truth is problematic. Uh, before you even get to the, the violent aspects of policing, I'm married to a, a public defender um, who actually during the Zoom just came home from work. And I deserve an award for the fact that he had to take off all of his clothes because he was, has this COVID and had to go wash them. So I saw all that in the periphery and I kept it straight, y'all. I kept it straight. Anyway, 
my husband is a public defender, and, and so I have always seen policing through the lens of their their power to lie and to obfuscate their own behavior, to police themselves, to to hide uh, when reports are written up about them. That is where I see it mostly. I'm not trying to downplay the the problem with their violence, but I also think they're they're being the arbiters of truth along with prosecutors. It's too much power. I think. Um... My, I'll go back to my first book, and in the plot of my first book, Dark, My Darkest Prayer, Nathan is a former deputy, and he quit because his parents were killed by a racist drunk driver. It was a road rage incident. He's a, a, a man of mixed race heritage. His father's white, mother's black, and a rich, racist white kid ran them off the road and killed them. And he saw, as a deputy, as a part of the blue line, that uh, the case was swept under the rug, and the wasn't their due, due diligence wasn't done, and he quits in the most vociferous manner. And um, but I grew up in a again. I'll go back to my own upbringing. I grew up in a small town, and one of the things that I advocate for in my writing is definitely a reform of the police. Because I will tell you, right now in in the town that I live in, um, four of the twelve deputies on my force are guys that either were in front of me in high school or behind me in high school, and I'm not trying to be funny but they are not the brightest bulbs in the lamp, you know, and, but they're cops and they have guns and they have the right to kill me if they see fit. The same guy that, you know, I had to like, you know, and when I was in school, used to try to cheat off my homework, you know, they probably couldn't spell cat if I spot you to see in the T. And so there's an identity idea in, especially in small towns that anybody that applies can be a cop. And a lot of times people apply or people that want the gun and the badge for a nefarious reason, reason. You know, my cousin is a nurse and she has to go to school for, she's a registered nurse, has to go to school for two years, has to pass the NCLEX, the national testing for uh, nurses. Um, you know, she has to be, she has to get recertified every couple of years. She has to have continual education uh, classes. None of that happens with police, especially in small towns, especially in a small like county, like where I live in Matthews County. Once you become a deputy, you can be a deputy for the next 20 years and you don't have to advance your knowledge one iota if you don't want to. Some do, some do try to, but you don't have to. You don't have to have any kind of national board certification to qualify your fitness for a cop. You can shoot somebody in a small town and go to the next town over and get a job again. And so I definitely advocate in my books, A, the faults and, and foibles of a police system in small towns and B, the lack of accountability for police officers. Uh, I'm working on something right now about, uh, I'm working on a book right now about two uh, men, one black, one white, both ex-cons who have seen the justice system and see how it doesn't work. And their sons, uh, their gay sons are murdered. And these two men take it upon themselves to seek revenge for their children, A, because they want to redeem themselves because both of them were horrible fathers and they were very homophobic when their children were growing up. But B, because they see that the cops are not really that interested in solving the case. And so it's definitely something as a writer that I take seriously. Um, but again, I do it within the context of writing a good story because nobody wants a 300 page sermon. So, yeah, and like, I went on a tangent. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> not, but you ended someplace where I wanted to start, which is, which is great. Because, like, the question about, you know, how can we use our imaginative powers maybe you know for good or, or to sort of push the public conversation in certain directions you know it's it's kind of a delicate thing to talk about because i don't want to sound like we're patting myself on the back like oh i'm saving the world through crime fiction because you know yeah. it's not like you know we're telling stories but you know at the same time you know people and, and to get to what Sean just said like people come to us to be entertained like these are crime stories or mysteries you know we can't just give a sermon we can't just hit people in the face with politics too much or they're going to put the book down like we need to entertain them there needs to be a hook there need to be good chapter endings and things like that and really draw them along but you know at the same time while you know we don't want to pat ourselves on the back at the same time we we're still hoping that you know, by creating these scenes and by creating these characters that we get people to care about and creating these, these visceral moments that people are going to remember and like forcing them to, to use their empathy and 
put themselves in that place, whether it's the cop's place, whether it's the place of somebody who just committed a crime and is hoping not to be caught or, or whoever, if we force them to like really be there in, in a visceral way that they sometimes don't let themselves go if they're just watching the news or reading a newspaper story or something, that we're going to affect them in a way that makes them think about an issue a little bit differently than they did before. And you know, the hope is that you know, if we do that right, you know, maybe we can move the needle in a certain way. And you know, I look back to some of the, the crime novels that I read when I was a kid, like in the 80s, the Spencer novels set in Boston or the, the Amos Walker novels set in Detroit. Those books were in worlds where the cities were these dark, places in a way that you really couldn't get away with right now. Like, you know, Boston's a pretty nice place. It's, it's, it's a pretty safe city. Um, but, but I think even though those books didn't feel like political at the time, certainly didn't feel that way to me as a high school kid, they were very political. There, this idea that cities were dangerous dark places um, is mm. very much, you know, the, the Reagan mentality that city, cities are evil and, and white folks should stay away from cities. And if you drive into the city, anything can happen to you in, in a way that, of course, someone is trying to talk about cities still being that way, of course. but. Um, and you, Adam, you spoke earlier about you know th these rural areas being the lawless areas today, and these rural areas being areas where certain characters feel more at risk. I mean, if we can write different types of stories, hopefully we can create different scenes and images in people's mind and make them think about the country we live in in, in different ways. Yeah, no, that, that seriously, I, I do appreciate you all fielding that question, right? When I when I drew it up, I was a little hesitant. I was just like, they're going to try to think I'm, you know getting them all into the politics. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I really want to think about this field, right, as, some, as a space to really do this kind of imaginative lifting. Um, and I, and I, and I, you know, I, I credit both, you know, well, all three of you really and kind of getting us there, right? Like in a weird way, we're having conversations about community policing, about diversifying the police force, about report in these texts, right, without actually calling it that. Right. So as a person who studies crime, who's into policing, you, whether you realize it or not, uh, like this, this actual, you know, stuff was was happening. And so we're wrapping up where, you know, I'm starting to feel questions here in the chat box from the audience that I'm going to throw out to you all here shortly. But before I do that, I wanted to ask, you know, Kareem, if you wanted to ask any kind of final question before I organize some of these Q&A from the audience. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I do have a question about, uh, well, I can see how offline about that question. Uh, as a grad student who studies um, crime fiction, what advice would you give someone like me? Um, can you hear me? Say my connection. I, I lost part of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the connection one. I was enough. saying um, as a grad student, yeah, I was saying as a grad student who studies crime fiction, um, what advice would you give someone like me? Advice for writing or for studying it? Well, I would say for studying it, uh, particularly um, as writers who are immersed in the genre. Um, I think there's a way where you guys have a sense of where the gaps are and what needs to be filled in terms of crime fiction when you think about the long arc from traditional crime fictions and the whodunits and coming all the way down into the hard-boiled fiction and the more contemporary writing that you guys are located. So I'm just wondering um, if you, well, I guess if I, if I could put it this way, if you, if y'all were, if, if y'all were read um, academic texts around crime fiction, what would, what would y'all want to look for? What would y'all look for? What would y'all, yeah, what would y'all look for? I don't know that I have an answer, but I will say like, I'm glad you're doing it because I think crime fiction sometimes does not get that sort of critical attention and analysis. So I think it's cool mm -hmm. doing it. I think, again, because it's sometimes viewed as like only entertainment or something and not this high art form. I mean, I think that's changing. I think generationally it's changing. Like so many people now mm -hmm. are raised with like, we've seen every possible genre in the theater and we read every possible genre, you know, as kids. And, and I think some of these borders and boundaries are dissolving away. And some of my favorite crime novels are written by people who weren't necessarily considered crime novelists, but tackled crime mm -hmm. and fiction. So I don't have any advice, but I'm just, I'll just say, keep doing it. I think it's great because I think crime fiction and with a lot of the younger writers coming up now, there's a lot of really great crime fiction and a lot of different issues are being explored in new ways. And I think it's an exciting time to be a reader. So I hope people keep reading and, and I hope people like yourself keep studying it. I, I echo what, what Tom said. 
Yeah, I would say just I would like to see more academic uh, analysis that breaks down the barrier between rural and uh, urban crime or rural and mm -hmm. crime in the country and crime in the cities. I think that a lot of times rural crime fiction like rural America is looked down upon in a certain way and that there is a, a you know, a plethora of, of uh, interesting and insightful crime fiction set in rural areas, whether it's the South, whether it's rural Indiana, Iowa, what have you, um, or, you know, but especially I'm partial to the South, you know, it, it takes a special breed of writer, especially if you're a writer of color to write about stuff in the South. And, and you know, I live in the home, I live in the state that was home to the capital of the Confederacy. You know, you, you can't be no punk writing in Virginia, so. <laughs> <laughs> nah, so, 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 so I have a, several questions here from the audience. I'm going to try to put some together um, and throw them out to the panel. Some are more directed to individual authors. And so I'm going to start with a question um, that's for Attica Locke, right? Where does the story start for you? Is it a character, an image, an event? Where does it begin? Uh, different books have been different things. Um, Blackwater Rising started the opening chapters and the event that happened very similarly to something in my own life. The cutting season, I went to a wedding at one of these crazy ass tourist plantations. Um, <laughs> Pleasantville, my dad ran for mayor. So those were events. Bluebird, Bluebird and Heaven, My Home is all place. It's all setting. I come from a long line of black Texans going back to slavery. And everybody's from little towns on Highway 59. So it is a love letter to Black Texans, but it comes from setting first for that particular series, but it just depends on the book. <laughs> all right, so and this one's for all three authors. All your novels are heavily steeped in knowledge. Do you set days for research and days for writing or do you intertwine the two? Where'd all that automotive knowledge come from, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good I, question. I, I, grew I was up, thinking that when I, I grew up book. as well. I'll, I'll say this. I'll answer the initial question in that question. I would like to say that I set days aside for research, but I do a lot of times where I just get lost in rabbit holes. I watch a lot of issues. I, I like. I watch a lot of episodes. How it's made for like an hour or two. Um, but um, as far as the automotive uh, knowledge, I grew up in, uh, really poor. And so by necessity, me and my brother had to become shade tree mechanics. I can remember going to the library and getting the Time Life series of books that taught you how to change alternators and fix brakes and stuff. I also had two cousins who were mechanical Mozarts. And they used to, I used to sneak out and get in so much trouble every weekend because I sneak out with my cousins and jump in the back of, back of his Maverick or Vega and we ride out to Route 17 and do uh, drag races, uh, drag races on Saturday nights. And uh, we were getting so much trouble because I wasn't supposed. I was like 12 or 13. I wasn't supposed to be out there. So a lot of that comes from my misspent you. For me, for research, because I've written historical novels, like you do have to do a lot of research, and I kind of enjoy it, but I would always much rather be writing. So what I typically do, like once I have an idea, I do like a little bit of research just to get kind of the basics down. And then I start doing some writing just to see if I can do it and if I like it. But the last thing I want to do is spend like six months researching something and then sit down to write it and just be like, oh man, I cannot do 1948 or I cannot do 1918. Um, yeah. And, and so then once I've got a little bit, I'm like, okay, I think this isn't terrible. I think I can do this. And then I do more. And uh, do I have research days and writing days? Like sometimes, but typically what happens is like, I try to do as much research as I need and then I keep going and eventually I'll hit hit a roadblock and realize, oh, I really need to go and read about this and that in order to figure this out. And so I kind of go back and forth. Yeah, I'll just say you have to be careful to not hide behind research because you could do it forever. I mean, at a certain point, you just kind of have to shit or get off the pot, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's true. That's, <laughs> That's true. true. Yeah. So, oh, all right. So th this will probably be the last question from the audience before we wrap up here. Um, do you think that the Black Lives Matter events this year will have an impact on your next book? Um, I can I answer easily no, simply because my book, Darren Matthews, when we, when we meet him in Bluebird, Bluebird, it's October 2016. Because of the way Bluebird, Bluebird ended, the next book had to come kind of quickly after it. And it's just Trump has been elected, but not inaugurated. And I think the next book in the series, we won't have caught up with it quite yet, but I bet the 
thematic stuff will be there. There's no way that it won't, but it won't be literal uh, living in the world that we're in now. There won't be a pandemic. There won't be any of the things that, that happen. But I think I'm always informed by what's going on, even when I am put a dateline on a story. I put a dateline in all my books. I put it in a place and time and seal it like that. But even in Heaven, My Home, uh, what's his name? Lil, uh, Jeff Sessions gets brought up, even though he hadn't even been you know, named as a potential AG yet. It's just, I found a way of working in the story because it was on my mind. So it'll be in there some kind of way. I think for me, my next project, I'm finishing it up right now, is set basically in 2016, but I think Black Lives Matter, the movement, the idea behind it, it permeates my writing because I, I'm a black person in America. And so the tenets of that movement, that idea that my life matters, that all lives matter, that it's important that you know we're not just cannon fodder, fodder is something that I think is in all my writing. So I'll definitely, you know, through just osmosis, it'll be in there. I don't know if it'll be directly mentioned. The book after this, I think will be more heavily involved so yeah to echo what Attica said you know, my, my, my next project or two are both set before 2020 so you know it's it's one of the, the battles you fight when you're writing historical fiction is that you don't want to be like overly informed by what's happening today but at the same time like we're alive now we're seeing this we're living it it's impossible to think that we're not going to be you know affected um and so you know you, you try not to let current events alter like a historical story but at the same time you know it's it's the world we live in it's a world we're breathing in, and of course we're affected by it. and i think looking forward i think we are going to see a lot of stories that that are, are are different and new as a result of what we've been going through the last few years yeah so all right so i know we have like three more minutes here um i'm, I'm, I'm gonna pose this question it was the last one that came in but i want to make sure we get it in i'm gonna pose it as a yes no right so we can kind of get through it quickly <laughs> if you're ready um all that all of the principal characters felt to me the person that submitted this question to be doing what they do to gain some power and control in their lives but in each case there are many ways in which they are powerless. Is this struggle something that you intentionally included in your stories? If so, I'll leave the if so part off because I want to keep it as a yes, no. So is this something, was this deliberate, right? This struggle um, that the people were seeking power but were ultimately powerless? Yes. Well. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can do the one word thing. I don't know that I can either because I actually think Darren has power. Mm -hmm. I think he just doesn't have the power to fix everything, but he has some power that's, but maybe that is the answer. So I guess, yes. <laughs> yeah, but, but I feel the same way. Like my characters are not powerless and Beauregard is not powerless. Like there's certain things they cannot do. They can't move heaven and earth. They can't snap their fingers and solve all their problems, but they do have agency. They do have power. And like as writers, you want characters who have power, have agency. And I think to build realistic characters, we wanna show all the limitations that the world puts on those characters. But we also wanna show them pushing back. So, so maybe the answer was yes too, but it's, it's, you know, it's a complicated, yeah. it's a complicated question. I think, Derek, I think Beauregard definitely has agency and he has power, but he's powerless to change the, the things that are the consequences of his actions. No, for sure. And so, um, so yeah, so we're two minutes here to the end. So just coming in, I'll, I'll say this, coming in, I was nervous about having a conversation with you all, mostly because again, I didn't want to give away too many spoilers of the book. <laughs> and and I, as, a, as a chance to sit and talk with you, I was going to be like, oh, what about this? Um, but also because as a historian, there are no spoilers, right? Like it happens. So conversations are almost always about like interpretations. What have we been misunderstanding? Why? Uh, but this was a new challenge. And I was really excited about today's conversation because it was an opportunity to speak and share the platform with some brilliant creative thinkers um, who really pushed me in new ways of thinking about crime, like not just in the South, but crime generally, but especially in the South. Um, and just the writing process more generally. So before we conclude, are there any parting words that you wanna share with those in attendance? And I'll, I'll, I'll give my parting word to Attica and I told you this off record, but I gotta tell you on record, I am here 
and available to be <laughs> casted for Marcus in the film with PhD in history in hand. <laughs> but parting words. Uh, Annika, we can't hear you. I'm, I'm muted because my phone rang. Uh, and I'm gonna jump off as soon as I answer this because I have actually, a it's still early where I am. Anyway, <laughs> I would say everybody keep reading. And I think that, that reading in general grows the heart, but I feel very much that reading crime fiction grows the mind about the way in which power works and, and, and what, how power structures look from the outside and from the inside. And I thank everybody. I have to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here, but I thank everybody so much. I say Bye. Thank you. It's an honor oh. being on this panel with you. Oh, right. Yes, back. yes. I love yourself. Bye. Out. Take care. My, my parting word real quick will be that I live here in Decatur, the home of the Decatur Book Festival, and I've been on the programming committee over the years, and I've, I've moderated a lot of panels, I've been on a lot of panels, but I helped put this one together, and I'm so excited with how it went. I love Sean, I love your book, I love all Attica's books, and this is a real treat to get everybody together, and Carl and Kareem, thanks so much, this is a lot of fun, and I'm bummed that we can't all go to a bar right now, which is what usually happens at the Decatur Book Festival, but I'm going to pretend you guys are with me, and I'm going to pour myself a drink, and I'm going to look forward to a, a future book festival where we can do that. Thank you. I, I'll just say it. I'm so pleased and so happy, so honored to be invited to be a part of this. The panel was great. Anybody that knows me that ever met me at one of those book festivals or anybody that ever met me at Bouchercon knows that once I, I can talk and pontificate about crime fiction all day long, so you have to stop me. And this was great to just talk with two writers that I find incredibly skilled and that I look up to that I've I feel it, it been a great influence, not just on my work, but other art, authors as well. And again, thank you for having me. I look forward to maybe one, can, one day coming to Decatur and actually having a mint julep or some moonshine as we talk about our books. So. <laughs> Kareem, you. do you want to give any parting words? Yes, I just want to say thank you all for writing some incredible, incredible books and creating lives and worlds that are often not highlighted. So um, thank you all for that. And um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity and, you know, you know, setting time aside to talk crime fiction because I don't always get the chance outside of the classroom to do so. Thank you so much. Carl, <laughs> write that Bigger Thomas book. I know, I know. One awesome. day, one day. I'm, uh, I'll, we'll I'll, talk about I'll that think later. about it. That's right. <laughs> no, thank you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to be the host. Uh, I love the Decatur Book Festival, second year now. Looking forward to next year in person where we can do this. So, All right. fingers crossed. Yeah. All right, everybody. Yes. yes, yes. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks everybody for being here. All right, y'all. Take. Thank you.